Welcome to Counter Apologetics. Welcome to Counter Apologetics. I'm your host, Emerson Green. My guest today is Dr. Dustin Crummett. Dustin received his PhD from the University of Notre Dame in 2018, and he specializes in social and political philosophy, ethics, and the intersection of these two fields in philosophy of religion. Dustin is a Christian philosopher, and his work comes highly recommended from me. I've linked interviews with him in the show notes on the Crusade Against Ignorance YouTube channel, which is where I first encountered Dustin. There you'll find In Defense of Socialism, a Christian philosopher answers some common objections to same-sex marriage, and applied ethics, abortion, and gun control. I brought Dr. Crummett on to discuss one of the better arguments for theism out there. We'll get into it in detail, but in a nutshell, it's sort of a fine-tuning argument focused on consciousness. I wanted to gain a better understanding of this argument, and while this isn't a debate, I did raise a few objections. It's something I'd like to see discussed more often, so I thought I would do my very small part in making it more widely known and well understood. So let me read from the introduction of this paper, and then we'll jump straight into the interview. This paper develops a new argument from consciousness to theism, the argument from psychophysical harmony. Roughly, psychophysical harmony consists in the fact that phenomenal states are correlated with physical states and with one another in strikingly fortunate ways. We argue that psychophysical harmony is strong evidence for theism. Since God has reason to design the psychophysical laws in order to bring about the values realized by psychophysical harmony, theism makes harmony much more likely than it would otherwise be. The argument still works if we accept or are open to alternative views about consciousness, such as dualist interactionism, physicalism, idealism, or Rosalian monism. End quote. I think that last bit is worth highlighting again. The purpose of this argument is to raise the likelihood of theism, and it doesn't require that you reject physicalism or materialism. Dustin, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So what is psychophysical harmony? Uh, so psychophysical harmony basically is the fact that there are certain um, appropriate matches between our conscious states and our physical states, our behavior or our beliefs and judgments understood in functional terms, that sort of thing. And this, this is not, the, the concept of psychophysical harmony is not original to uh, my co-author, Brian Cutter and I. This is something that's discussed in, I don't know, mainstream philosophy of mind or whatever, right? For instance, we're disposed to pursue valuable hedonic states and to avoid disvaluable ones. We uh, if something feels good, you do it again. If something feels bad, you probably don't do it again, right? Um, so that's a kind of harmony. Uh, we, I think we call it hedonic harmony. Um, this, uh, you know, tendency to have appropriate dispositions towards uh, hedonic states. Um, or I say uh, there's a cup-shaped object in my visual field, and sure enough, there is a cup-shaped object in my visual field. Uh, so there's a match between the, the semantic content of my statement and the actual contents of my conscious experience. So that's semantic harmony. Um, there, there may be some other kinds too, but those are the two main ones that we focus on in, in, in the paper is, is the, the hedonic and the semantic points. Right. And as you say, like, you know, other philosophers of other philosophers who are not theists have noted the data of psychophysical harmony as well, like David Chalmers or Adam uh, Potts, I think his name is. Um, and like plenty of non-theists have noticed the same thing in other contexts, but you're just saying, hey, this is evidence for theism. Right, right. It, it's not just, I, I mean, maybe maybe we're going to ask this next anyway. It's not just that they've noted that this phenomenon exists, but they've noted that it it seems puzzling, at least given certain views of the mind, right? So what is, well, I mean, what is the puzzling thing about it? Um, well, uh, to start, uh, suppose that dualism and epiphenomenalism are true. So dualism, uh, mental states, or at least conscious states and physical states are distinct, and they could vary independently. Uh, you could have, you know, the same physical states without uh, mental states, or you could have, you know, a different arrangement of mental states or something. Um, and epiphenomenalism 
um, the the physical is causally closed, and so your conscious states, uh, your non-physical conscious states, don't have any causal impact on what happens in the physical world. Uh, they're just sort of byproducts. They're epiphenomena, right? Um, and actually, both of these assumptions we say we can dispense with. You don't need either one. So we we ultimately think the argument from psychophysical harmony works, even if you are uh, a panpsychist, even if you're an interactionist dualist, uh, even if you are um, uh, a physicalist, we say, maybe surprisingly. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get around to that. But uh, as for what the puzzle is, um, <clears throat> so given dualism and epiphenomenalism, um, well, it could be that uh, you have the same physical states and uh, wildly different arrangements of mental states, right? We could have been zombies who had no conscious experiences. We could have had pain and pleasure inverted, uh, and then we would pursue uh, uh, the painful experiences instead. Um, it, it could have been that my visual field was just crazy static, you know, it was just white noise, and yet I would still say there's a cup-shaped object in my visual field. Uh, it could have been that I had no visual field. Maybe my only conscious experience is tepid bath water uh, sensation, uh, the sensation of touching. That's the only, maybe that's the only conscious experience anybody ever has, no matter right. what state. They're You'd in. still be behaving physically like exactly the same way, but your internal conscious life would be different. Yeah. And because uh, on epiphenomenalism, your conscious states make no causal difference, you would behave in exactly the same way. So I would still say all these things, even though they no longer matched up with my conscious experience. I would still act in ways that were no longer rationally appropriate in light of my conscious experience. I would I would go around, uh, you know, inflicting what were in fact very terrible uh, conscious states on my loved ones, and uh, they would say, "Oh, thank you," you know, and, and I would I would keep doing it, and um, so it would be a real it would be a real mess. Um, and uh, if you think about this possibility. Um, then it becomes, in a way, quite puzzling, right? Um, why is it, if it's really true that the psychophysical correlations, maybe we need to talk about what that means, the, the correlations between conscious states and physical states, if those could have been wildly different, and, you know, the vast majority of different states could have been, would have been disharmonious, including a lot of the simplest ones, you know, the one that just assigns tepid bathwater to everything or whatever, Um uh, including a lot of the simplest ones, um, and they don't make any causal difference, how is it that we wound up uh, with with this set of uh, behavior and judgment on the one hand, belief on the one hand, and conscious experience matching? Um, and uh, philosophers of mind who have talked about this often have thought, oh, this is a problem for the epiphenomenalist dualist, right? Uh, because they can't explain why um, uh, psychophysical harmony obtains. But they think other people can, though. And what we say is actually, no, it's a much wider problem, and you need some sort of other, other type of explanation to explain why it obtains. And that's where, uh, that's where the theism comes in. Right. No, I've made that exact argument against epiphenomenalism with, with more detail and like natural selection and stuff. Like if your conscious experiences have literally no effect on, you know, outcomes, then, um, I guess we're just really lucky that things kind of lined up in this way and not some terrible way, like, yeah, pain, pleasure, inversion, or just something totally weird because your conscious experiences have no effects. But yeah, I mean, you could imagine a world where things are tuned such that like the frustration of our desires is the norm rather than the satisfaction of them. So like, I want to raise my hand, but instead I raise my eyebrows you know, or like the pain and pleasure inversion. The the desire example, so this is actually a, a separate kind of harmony that Philip Goff talks about. So that example depends upon what people call cognitive phenomenology. So is there something that it's like to have a desire or to have a belief or something like that? Um, and if there is, if there if those are conscious states too, or there are associated conscious states, you have this whole other problem of okay, I desire to get a beer. I believe that there's beer in the fridge, so I get up and walk to the fridge. How is it that the belief and desire phenomenology match up with my behavior so nicely? You know, if, if, they, had been t if they had been absent or if they had been, uh, you know, I, I had phenomen phenomenology as of uh, believing that there was a scary tiger in the fridge, I still would have gone to the fridge. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, and like all that might seem kind of like 
fantastic, but it's a conceivable way that things could have been. Like, that's all we're really saying is like, things conceivably could have been that way. Well, they're not that way. So why are they not that way? Um, but yeah, you say that the laws of nature are tuned in like strikingly fortunate ways. So by that, you mean like valuable states of affairs, right? Like it's better for us that things are harmonious instead of disharmonious. Yeah, yeah. Or at least it, it realizes certain values. I mean, what's what's significant for us about it is that it's it's you can see some reason, at least why a designer might want to bring about uh, agents who exhibit harmony rather than agents who just have, you know, random phenomenology or uh, the sort of bad inversion scenarios or something like that. Right. Whereas like in different nature, you know, if, if nature is just fundamentally indifferent to us and to valuable states of affairs generally, then disharmony is at least just as likely as harmony, you know, in the absence of like some other explanation that could possibly explain harmony. Plausibly even more likely, I, I think. I mean, yeah. you do get into questions about infinity and, and this sort of thing and how to deal with contrasting infinite sets and stuff like this. But uh, I mean, it, intuitively, if you try to imagine, you know, what, what is the space of harmonious versus disharmonious sets of laws? Uh, well, uh, you know, for every way that things can be harmonious, you can imagine all sorts of ways, you know, little deviations or inversions mm -hmm. or some things are missing or something else is there. Um, so, uh, you know, there are sorts of technical problems we don't need to get into, but it, it seems quite plausible to me to think that actually like the the odds of harmony arising just by chance are really, really, really low. Um, uh, because, you know, so much has to be right in order to get um, harmonious, harmonious sets of laws. And we've just kind of been assuming epiphenomenalism for the sake of argument, to be, which is fine because like many naturalists do believe in epiphenomenalism. But it's easier to just say, hey, they're like the physical functional states on the one hand and the phenomenal states on the other. You know, that's like that makes it as easy as possible to like present the argument. But like you mentioned, you don't have to be a dualist of any kind. Um, epiphenomenalist or not. So like, you know, most people listening to this will probably be physicalists, but reaffirming physicalism does nothing to undermine this argument. You can still be a physicalist and uh, this still applies to you because this is an argument for theism. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, this doesn't require that you reject physicalism to recognize this as an argument. So everyone can just keep their pants on about that and calm down. Um, but yeah, that's part of why I think this is one of the uh, two good arguments from consciousness that that exist. Um, but yeah, you can remain a physicalist and this argument still applies to you. Should we should we talk about why that is? Well, first, can we um, I think that one thing that people are going to spring is going to spring to many people's minds is that this is like a God of the gaps argument. Um, now, I think that's not true. But uh, would you care to explain why this is not a God of the gaps argument? Well, I mean, it's a little, some people just want to say that about any, anything whatsoever that attempts to invoke God, you know, the stars in the sky spell out the Nicene Creed uh, <laughs> in 45 different languages simultaneously. I would rather wait for a naturalistic. <laughs> yeah, this is just a God of the, you know, we don't know what the natural explanation of that is, right? Uh, you know, we just have to wait. Well, you know, the jury's still out. I would rather wait for a naturalistic explanation of this phenomenon than give in to magic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess I would say this. Um, I mean, I take it a God of the gaps argument is, is supposed to have the form. We don't know how X obtains, therefore God did it or something like that. Right. And of course, that's a terrible argument. Um, that's not the form of our argument here. The, the way we put it in the paper more formally is as a Bayesian argument. We say, look, we have um, this observation, the fact that psychophysical harmony obtains. We think it's very unlikely that it would obtain on, uh, you know, a sort of broadly naturalistic picture of the world, one where there's no purpose, no uh, tendency to produce value as such uh, at, at bottom. Um, and yet not wildly unlikely that God might be interested in bringing about this, uh, this, uh, state of affairs. And so, because it's much more likely on theism than on naturalism and re relevantly similar worldviews, very strong evidence for theism, uh, right. over those other things. And that's, that's, a, you know, I mean, 
unless people want to reject Bayes' theorem or something, you know, is, 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 that, is that God of the gaps? Right? No, I think it's just... Just a- any observation strongly favors like one hypothesis as compared to another if the first hypothesis assigns a probability that's much bigger um, to that observation than the comparative hypothesis. So like we have this observation, psychophysical harmony, and it's like theism, you know, assigns a very high probability to that. Whereas like, you know, the, the standard, like more the standard, like atheistic view of like nature being totally indifferent um, to us, like that actually leads us to that that makes psychophysical harmony like pretty surprising because there are so many other ways it could have been different it could have got wrong yeah yeah it, it i mean just the general point is if you get some piece of evidence and it's more likely on one theory than the other then it's evidence for the one theory uh, rather than the other and we say psychophysical harmony more likely on theism than on broadly naturalistic uh standard athe- forms of atheism right um, so this is uh, the way I, I give the elevator pitch for this argument sometimes is like, it's like the fine tuning argument, but for consciousness, Yeah. but it's like, uh, it's sort of better off than the cosmological fine tuning argument for at least one big reason, which has to do with the multiverse, because, you know, say that you read Sean Carroll and come to believe in the multiverse, and then there's this kind of like observer selection effect. So you can't find yourself in non finely tuned universes. Um, so of course ours is finely tuned, but, um, that doesn't work here because you can find yourself in disharmonious universes. It's just that your life would suck. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, this is the exact, I mean, you know, there are questions about whether the multiverse response works, um, against the, the cosmological fine tuning argument, but even suppose it does, it works because there's this observer selection effect. Um, and the problem is, if we're imagining, you know, there's a big multiverse where psychophysical laws are being randomly varied or something. Yeah, it is true that sooner or later, you're going to have psychophysically harmonious people. But you should expect most observers are not going to be psychophysically harmonious, right? They're going to be the people who wind up with the white noise visual field or whatever. Um, and so it's very striking that that we have uh, harmonious experiences. And that doesn't seem to be explicable by, um, by the, the sort of multiverse move, um, because it it would require that we be situated in an extremely unusual way, uh, which seems a priori unlikely. Right. So, um, I think something that will spring to many people's minds, and also I, I think it's an open question, at least for me, like how much this does answer why some psychophysical harmony exists natural selection like if we're talking about um you know way things conceivably could have been and why they're relatively relatively harmonious um you know natural selection seems like it would be the easiest way to explain psychophysical harmony because surely selection would favor harmonious minds over disharmonious minds so that certainly won't work on dualist epiphenomenalism right because there the conscious states are making no difference to anything and so um, the, uh, the evolutionary story would have played out in exactly the same way, um, regardless of whether our qualia were absent or were inverted or were screwed up in some weird way or whatever, right? Um, it can't make any difference to anything that happens in the physical world. And of course, evolution is about what happens in the physical world. So that wouldn't work. Um, now, I think William James actually makes that well, I know William James makes that argument against epiphenomenalism, but but say that you were like a say you were like a physicalist, though. I mean, like... yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So maybe maybe it will be helpful to just run through the different sorts of views one might have. Um, suppose that you were um, an interactionist dualist, so you think well, you have conscious states, but they can affect what happens in the physical world. Wouldn't that solve the problem? Um, There we say no, because what that does is sort of push the problem uh, back into the question of the laws governing causal relations between the physical and uh, uh, the mental. Um, So it seems perfectly conceivable if you already agree with the dualist that, you know, pain and pleasure could have been inverted or whatever. It also seems perfectly conceivable that their causal roles could have been inverted, that having pleasure states... um, caused uh, aversion behavior, right, or vice versa. 
Um, so uh, merely merely introducing causal interaction um, doesn't doesn't help. Sorry, my cat is here trying to get my attention. <laughs> um, you want to say hi to everybody, bud? Yeah. Hey there. Is that a is that a girl? This is a boy. This is Apollo. What's his name? Apollo. Apollo. There is a girl cat, but she's in the other room. Her name is Artemis. Oh, yeah, because I, I just remember seeing a picture of, uh, I think it was Artemis, like, sitting by the window, and then there was this outdoor male, male cat, like, trying to get her attention, and she was, like, totally indifferent. <laughs> to yeah, she had, a, she had an admirer uh, for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, it, it would be a little bit, uh, merely introducing interaction as dualism, we say, would be a little bit like this. Um, suppose that there's a, a machine uh, and the machine um, uh, makes noises. And then there's another machine. And the other machine um, prints out uh, uh, something every time the first machine makes a noise. And um, the, uh, the, it turns out that there's semantic correspondence between these two things. So the first machine will uh, play a rising tone, and then the second machine writes out rising tone where it makes a beep boop sound and the second machine prints out beep boop. And we wonder why is there this match? Um, merely suggesting the first machine is causing the second machine to do this does not solve the problem of the match, right? Uh, it, if it, it could, it could have been that the first machine makes a noise and the second machine that causes the second machine to just print out some unrelated thing. Right. Uh, in order to explain the correspondence, you need, to say not only is the first machine causing the second machine to print this thing out, but it's presumably been designed in the right way that what it prints out is a, a description of the noise that the first machine made, right? Um, and in a similar way, we suggest uh, if our mental states are non-physical and are causing physical states, then we need um, a certain sort of fine-tuning of the causal laws in order for that to produce um, uh, rationally and semantically uh, appropriate behavior so the the causal laws could have been different and that's what you're honing in on yeah okay. it seems it's, it seems so yeah it seems um uh so that's the the thing to say to dualist interactionists um what might we say to say a panpsychist um well uh panpsychists often will agree that uh, you could have had like the same structural properties, what people usually think of as physical properties, while varying the uh, the internal intrinsic character, the quiddities of, of the entities here, the the what the panpsychists identify with the conscious with the qualia, right? Um, so they'll say, uh, look, we can agree with all these dualist conceivability arguments and stuff because we'll say. Um, look, yeah, it could have been that what we ordinarily think of as the physical could have been the same, but uh, conscious experiences were inverted or whatever. Um, and then you get the exactly the same problem you had with, with dualism, right? Um, uh, because why? how is it that we got the, the right set of quiddities, right? Um, now, when it comes to uh, physicalism, this is the hardest case, right? Uh, so... Um, we have to distinguish a priori and a posteriori physicalism. So the a priori physicalist thinks there's some sort of like conceptual connection. There's some sort of a priori connection between the mental and the physical. Uh, you can just tell by reflecting on the concept of pain and the concept of uh, avoidance behavior that those things had to be linked in the way that they are or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, that view would solve the problem. That view, okay, so nothing else is even conceivable, right? Uh, and no, nothing psychophysically disharmonious is even conceivable. That solves the problem, okay. That view is false though, right? <laughs> um, uh, and, and most physicalists reject that view. Most physicalists say, look, obviously we can conceive of philosophical zombies or inverts or whatever. We can conceive of all the scenarios I've been describing. I don't think anybody watching has been hearing me talk about these scenarios and like, what? Like, <laughs> I literally can't even conceive of any. <laughs> clearly, it's not like a round circle or something like that. What they right. say is, yes, these things are conceivable, but they're not metaphysically possible. Uh, it's an a posteriori truth 
that actually mental states and physical states are the same thing. Uh, there's this synthetic identity between them, just like water and H2O or whatever. Um, and so it's it's necessary. These, these scenarios I've been describing are metaphysically impossible, even though they're conceivable. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, here's what we say about that. Um, so the a posteriori physicalist, which again is the significant majority of physicalists, all right, the same, right. all the same physicalists, right? Um, uh, the the a posteriori physicalist um, says uh, all these things that the dualist thought, or at least most of these things that the dualist thought were metaphysical possibilities. They're still a priori epistemic possibilities, um, and what that means is. Going in, a posteriori physicalism does not predict epistemically psychophysical harmony. Um, and uh, we suggest what matters here are the epistemic probabilities. And so because theism uh, epistemically, the, the epistemic probability of harmony is much higher than on a posteriori, a posteriori physicalism, uh, it's, it's good evidence for theism. So an analogy. Um, Suppose we're talking about the, the cosmic fine-tuning problem, right? Um, and suppose someone comes along and they say, okay, I, I've got the solution for you. I'm a spinozist. I think that there, the universe is necessary. There was just this universe and it's just necessary and it just had to have uh, these constants. The constants had to have these values. Um, okay, is that a satisfying answer to the psychophysical or to the, the cosmic fine-tuning problem? Um, and we're inclined to think no, because, okay, but Spinozism itself doesn't predict, I mean, it could, it could have been that anything was the necessary mm -hmm. set of values for the constants, right? Spinozism itself doesn't predict fine tuning. Um, what predicts fine tuning is in fact, one very specific version of Spinozism, the version that says not only are the constants necessary, but this set of constants is necessary. Uh, and of course, the a priori probability of that version is correspondingly small. I mean, it buys its predictive power by just selecting, you know, this one little bit of the, the epistemic probability space. Um, or another analogy, um, and this is one that we give in the paper, um, suppose that we're astronomers in ancient Babylon, um, and we have a very large number of objects in our astronomical system. Um, and uh, it, uh, two of them are the morning star and the evening star. And our local religion contains the, uh, the prophecy that, or it, it, one of its doctrines is that the morning star and the evening star have all the same properties. Um, perhaps because the, the, you know, two different gods made them as a sign of harmony between them or something like this. Okay. And then we examine the morning star and the evening star, and we discover that actually they do have all the same properties. Um, I think that would be compelling evidence for, for uh, us ancient Babylonian astronomers um, for this local religion, right? Um, we could imagine, yeah, there is this alternative hypothesis that they're the same thing, but uh, you know, just the hypothesis that the morning star, say, is identical to some other object in our ontology. Uh, that wouldn't yield this prediction that it has exactly the same properties as as the evening star. Um, so uh, that that would be compelling evidence if we discovered, ah, it was exactly what our religion said. Um, in this case, uh, it looks like theism predicts psychophysical harmony. Um, we can say, okay, well, maybe this was necessary, but that's, you know, a post hoc, uh, okay, we're, we're going to endorse this one very specific version of physicalism, the one that says that the, harmo the harmony is what's necessary. Um, but that requires rejecting all of these a priori um, uh, possible uh, other alternatives. Um, so that's, I, I'm not sure. I mean, th th this is, this is the hardest part of the argument. Did that make sense? Yeah. I mean, let's just, uh, like go through that again. So it's like physicalism, we, we said earlier, you know, you don't need to reject physicalism to, to like, you know, take this as a good argument, but there is one caveat there, which is you do have to reject a priori physicalism. But the thing is most physicalists reject a priori physicalism. It's, you know, it's, it's not, um, the favored version and it's, um, you know, it, that would entail that, like, 
these aren't even epistemic possibilities that we're talking about. Like disharmony is not like, you know, they're, they're saying I can't even conceive of qualia inversion, which seems slightly disingenuous because of course you can, but um, yeah. So, we're, so like we're, we're <laughs> could, could you try, could you try again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This might be due to a lack of imagination on, on your part, but um but yeah, so a posteriori physicalism, which is more popular, this argument does apply to to that form. Um, so that's where the conceivability point still kicks in because the a posteriori identities could have been different. Um, they, so, they, ep epistemically, they could have been different. Epistemically, course, physically, they couldn't have been, but epistemically, they could have been. A priori, they could have been. Right. If you're if you're an a, a posteriori physicalist, um, you still think that these are like metaphysical necessities, like the connection between the functional state and the phenomenal state like yeah they're they're um you know identical or realized by one another or something they're like connected by necessity in some way but the point is they're epistemically possible so we can still say you know we can assign some kind of probability to them and the analogy that you gave was with um you know say that you're a necessitarian and you know in the paper you mentioned like the you know the arrangement of the stars in the sky um okay so that's metaphysically necessary but that doesn't mean that like your theory predicts this exact arrangement of stars in the sky and like say that, you know, like you mentioned at the outset, like imagine that you make an egregious God of the gaps argument and appeal to um, th that there's a message in the stars that says I'm the alpha, and the omega. And, um, you know, so necessitarianism doesn't make that go away, like just because it's necessary that things would have turned out this way that there would have been that arrangement or well, or at least it, it only makes it go away if it just makes everything go you know like you, right. you we, we walk in on on donald trump holding a big bag of money that says from vladimir putin and we say isn't this so much more likely if vladimir putin and he says no it's metaphysically necessary like, what do you mean? <laughs> it, it, it just had to happen it just appeared here you know like if if you go this route you just destroy all all ability to reason empirically so. right yeah yeah exactly it yeah so so like the odds of that of that message in the stars, you know, or whatever example you choose, like obviously that is evidence favoring some hypotheses over others, even though, you know, the way that things turned out is like necessary somehow. Um so it's like the difference between like metaphysical and epistemic possibility, like it does open up uh, the way for this kind of argument. And if you want to say that like, oh well, a posteriori physicalism actually answers this, or or I'm a necessitarian or a determinist or something, so this isn't the problem for me, like, then that would also commit you to saying, you know, like a message in the stars would not be evidence because determinism is true. Yeah. Yeah. Which of course would would be an absurd, an absurd position. Right, right. It it may be there is one little wrinkle here because you might think um, in order for God to have any control over whether psychophysical harmony obtains, physicalism has to be false. Um, it, it has to be that somehow God can affect whether or not psychophysical harmony obtains. And um, uh, you might think that requires uh, that God can actually change whether the psychophysical laws are true or not. Um, so, which it may not, it, it, it may actually, it may not require this. Um, if someone thinks that, then, then we say it could be that at the end of the argument, you should give up physicalism because you think, look, the only, the only way this could have obtained or, you know, the overwhelmingly likely way that this obtained is through design. All but design requires that the connection be contingent. So the connection must be contingent. Um, uh, in the same way that, um, uh, you you come to the the island of boulders, and you think that none the boulders are very big boulders. You think none of them are are humanly movable, uh, and then you show up, and you you notice that the boulders spell out "Welcome to the island of boulders," uh, and you think ah someone must have moved them there, right? Um, okay, well that's evidence that the boulders are are humanly movable after all, right? Um, if it turns out uh, you maybe you start out thinking, look, the psychophysical laws are actually necessary identities. Um, so even God couldn't change them. You know, uh, it had had the had they uh, necessitated inversion, God couldn't do anything about that, right? Um, uh, you might think 
Um, oh, but wait a minute. Now I see that just like the boulders spell out, welcome to the island of boulders. Now I see actually there's this precise, finely tuned pattern of uh, psychophysical laws that really strongly supports design. I might then, just like I concluded, also the boulders must be humanly movable. I might then uh, conclude, uh, so it must be metaphysically possible to change uh, the correlations. Uh, and that might lead me to some form of non-physicalism. Uh, again, you might think, you know, maybe theism affects the a priori probability of the necessary identities, or maybe, you know, you could, you imagine that there are sort of different, lots of different physical arrangements, and maybe some of them would be harmonious and some wouldn't, so God could bring about the harmonious ones. Or, you know, there are different ways of maybe getting around that point. But I say all that just to flag it may be that the argument will require that you give up physicalism at the end, but it doesn't start out assuming that physicalism is false. We do require that a priori physicalism be false, but it's quite, it's quite fine if you start out with a very high credence, as long as it's not one or like, you know, it, right, it, right. if you start out with a very high credence and not posteriori physicalism. Right. So by the end of this argument, you know, you might realize that psychophysical harmony is, is evidence, very strong evidence against physicalism, but you don't need to assume physicalism is false to, like, accept the data of psychophysical harmony. Yeah. Right. Um, so the reason we initially got all into all that is because I brought up natural selection. So, ah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, okay. Very good. Very good. Very good. Um, so point being, um, a natural selection... Uh, will um, select for harmony uh, assuming that certain preconditions obtain, right? Uh, if there is mental, so we said epiphenomenalism, you know, the mental states don't affect natural selection whatsoever. Um, on views where mental causation occurs, uh, where mental to physical causation occurs, um, then... Uh, Natural selection is going to um, select for harmonious. Uh, uh, it, it's going to select for harmonious behavior and so forth, only assuming that the causal connections run the right way. So, uh, if it's the case that pain uh, causes avoidance behavior, say, then uh, or you know causes whatever the preconditions for avoidance behavior are. pain causes some behavior that is uh, evolutionarily advantageous uh, then um, uh, and is harmonious uh, then natural selection will select for the harmonious course of action right mm -hmm. um, but not otherwise um, if you imagine the world where um, pain and pleasure are inverted and their causal profiles are inverted so not only does pain occur under the conditions where pleasure currently occurs, but it has the same impact, causal impact on the physical uh, that pleasure currently has, then that's not going to make any difference to natural selection, right? That's going to produce all the same behaviors, even though it's, it's disharmonious. Um, so uh, natural selection ultimately is not really going to help, uh, we think. A lot of people think that it does. Um, but we think ultimately it's not really going to help because you have to get, um, you know, harmonious sets of causal relations in place uh, before um, natural selection is, is going to lead to harmonious behavior and judgments and that sort of thing. Uh, did that make sense? I mean, it, I, I think where I'm getting tripped up is just, um, you know, sort of separating like the causal laws from from everything else, or even just the concept of a psychophysical law to begin with. Like, I think this might be a more general problem um, with me, because it, with with the, the concept of natural laws, is like, for whatever reason, I, I just don't know what natural laws are. Like, I can't figure out, like, and I'm not trying to, you know, I don't have like a an anti-realist position and I'm like saying, oh, I don't even know what these are. Like, no, I literally, I don't have a realist position. I don't have an anti-realist position. For whatever reason, uh, Mormon God designed me such that he really does not want me to know what natural laws are. Like, I listened to, um, I listened to Kane B talk about it in like two different videos. I listened to like a Great Courses lecture about it. I've read a little bit about it in Philosophy of Science books and it's like, 
I, it's it, it always goes the same way where it's like it sort of is making sense to me for like 15 minutes like whatever view i'm reading and then my brain just like melts and it stops making sense and it all just sounds like nonsense to me so i think this might be a problem specific to me but i don't really know what psychophysical laws are and i don't really know what laws of nature are um despite trying to understand them so um so what is a, a psychophysical law of nature because it seems like that kind of factors into the natural selection answer here so I, I don't think that any controversial question about the ontology of natural laws or psychophysical laws should make any difference here. Um, we, we could even replace maybe the term law with like correlation pattern or something like that, correlation description. Um, so, I mean, the psychophysical laws, you know, there are different views about what laws of nature are. Are they mere descriptions? Are they... Uh, statements about relations between universals, are they divine decrees, are they blah, 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 right? Um, but um, I think uh, for our purposes, I mean, the, the things I'm calling psychophysical laws, uh, which we could instead call correlation patterns or whatever, uh, there'll be statements of the form, um, you know, when such and such physical state occurs, such and such mental state occurs. Um, if there is mental to physical causation, maybe we could include also statements of the form and when such and such mental state occurs, such and such physical state will, will occur, right? Or it will have this causal input on the physical state or whatever. Um, and all we really need is, is that. You can just think about all these statements like that, and what are those reflecting ontologically? Or is it a mere Humean mosaic? Is there something else to it? Uh, that shouldn't really matter, I don't think. Um, and uh, the the trick is when it comes to the natural selection point. I mean, of course, if uh, if pleasure, um, if it's the case that avoidance behavior in, in the presence of pain and pursuit behavior in, in uh, uh, the presence of pleasure. Um, if it's the case um, that those things are evolutionarily advantageous, then of course natural selection will be able to explain why you do the one and are, are disposed to do the one and, uh, and to do the other and not to do the inverse, right? But if pain and pleasure had been inverted, including their, their causal roles, if it had been the case that uh, every time the damaging stimulus occurs, you felt pleasure, and then the pleasure caused you uh, to engage in avoidance behavior, uh, then that would be just as good from the, perspe from, from the perspective of natural selection. And, and, and if, this, if, this, if uh... the inverse was true for pain, that would be just as good. And this would be like conceivable on a posteriori physicalism or Rosalian monism, like the idea that the well, physical. So it gets a little tricky because the talk about laws maybe seems particularly inapt on a posteriori physicalism. On a posteriori physicalism, what is a priori conceivable is that pain turns out to be this physical state that results in pursuit behavior. Oh, I see. Okay. And yeah, and pleasure turns out to be this physical state that results in avoidance behavior. Um, in fact, there are the other things, and we've learned this a posteriori, so the a posteriori physicalist things. But had they been the had the, had it been the other way, of course we would behave the, the exact same way. The physical states would be the same. They would just be different mental states. Um, and that would be just as good from the perspective of natural selection. If if the identities had been inverted, uh counter possibly if the identities had been inverted then we would behave in exactly the same way right so and this doesn't whatever makes it the case that you know the identities are what they are like natural selection doesn't affect those it's right. just acting on like adaptive behavior and like that sort of thing yeah natural selection if it's correct to talk about psychophysical laws or psychophysical identities or whatever natural selection is not selecting between those right, natural right. selection selects with those in place and so unless you have those finely tuned in the right way natural selection is not going to lead to harmonious behavior
so it's sort of like, you know, natural selection is not affecting the mass of the electron. It's just kind of working with whatever mass it was given. I'm trying to think of another law of nature that natural selection doesn't affect. Well, I guess it doesn't affect any of them, unless right. you count certain laws of biology. You know, the, the, the law of gravity is not something that natural selection affects either way, right? It, it just takes, it takes place against the backdrop of that law. If there was no law of gravity, I guess there wouldn't be any natural selection, right? Because nothing would stick together in the right way. Or, or, I mean, some things would stick together, but large planets and things wouldn't stick together in the right way. Um, I mean, I think that makes sense. So, um, really quickly, though, what is the law of nature <laughs> in your view? Uh, I don't know. No, you don't know either? No, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think I understand the concept, but in terms of what, what it is ontologically, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, it, it may be something like descriptions of causal powers or something like that, um, would, would maybe be my guess. So, you know, theism's ability to predict valuable states of affairs relative to indifference, that's kind of what's giving it its advantage here, right? Like, you know, we have, val like, harmony is valuable. Theism can uniquely predict valuable states of affairs, you know, especially compared to, like, a hypothesis of indifference or something like that. Um, right. So is that basically, like, what it comes down to? Yeah, I think that's right. I guess just on the natural selection question again, it's like, you know, there is correspondence between like value and adaptivity, right? Like there's some, I mean, but you're saying that that's sort of a, a contingent fact about our world that could have conceivably been different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, l let me be clear. I'm not denying that there is, say, an evolutionary explanation in some sense of why, you know, sex feels good or whatever, right? Um, uh, it's just that, had the psychophysical laws been wildly different, then there would be an equally good evolutionary explanation about why it feels bad or, you know, what, right. Um, okay, so, so you're not, just to be clear, you're not denying that there are evolutionary explanations of, uh, you know, or, you know, like natural selection. It still does do all this explanatory work, but you're just saying that, like, the thing in question really are these laws of nature, you know, and natural selection can't affect that. Yeah, yeah. And had and had they been different, then uh, uh, natural selection could have played out in the same way uh, with disharmonious, um, disharmonious states instead. So, like um, one way that a naturalist, like you know, kind of like an ordinary naturalist, which that's kind of your target. You know, you mentioned that there are these, well, you call them theism adjacent hypotheses, which. Um, is uh, sneaky in some ways. I don't because I am sympathetic to some of these theism adjacent hypotheses. I wouldn't call them theism adjacent myself, but um, but yeah, I mean your target. The thing is, like you know, you mentioned at one point, like if we just kind of grant that um, that this is evidence against that type of naturalism, then that's pretty significant. Like if the real conversation is between like you know Thomas Nagel and theists instead of like um, you know ordinary like reductive physicalists. You know, I mean, that's that's pretty significant by itself. So, like, you do mention that these um, that psychophysical harmony. It's not that it's evidence against like all forms of naturalism. It's just that it's evidence against the kinds of naturalism that are more widely subscribed to. But um, if we wanted to decide between like something that's closer to my form of naturalism, then we would have to decide you know, based on other considerations, because this data is equally good evidence, I would think, for something closer to, you know, my spookier form of naturalism. Yeah, it, it, so other views on which there's some sort of fundamental bias towards producing these values or something might explain the data equally well. Um, and that, that could include maybe axiarchism, uh, although axiarchism plausibly entails theism, so maybe that's not a real dispute, but uh, maybe axiarchism, um, maybe the Nagel-type natural teleology or some sort of value involving a uh, set of natural laws or a set of meta-laws that help determine what the laws are, or, uh, you know, maybe Draper-style aesthetic deism. There's a designer who doesn't just care about moral goodness, but maybe cares about aesthetic values. Um, it might be that that all of those views um, 
predict the data about equally well. Yeah. And then we would have to um, decide uh, between theism and those other views on other grounds. Um, and this, of course, this is a, a general, um, you know, it's, it's a general well-known problem in philosophy of science, I guess, that observations, there are always lots of different hypotheses that account for any observation just as well. And you have to decide on other grounds. Um, yeah. But Right, right. Under determination. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, sorry, I just remembered a conversation I had, um, a long time ago where I was like trying to explain that concept to somebody and like, he was just like really aggressively not getting it and like, um, insisting that it matters like who made the prediction or something like it was just a really bizarre epistemic system. But, um, in defense of the, uh, the more, I don't know, standard forms of naturalism. Um, someone who is an error theorist has like an easy reply to this. Like you mentioned in the paper that, um, you know, you can become an, become an error theorist where there are no normative facts at all. So there's no data to explain. There's no normative harmony to explain. So, um, quote, pain is not bad and does not give one a reason to avoid and eliminate it. Visual experiences do not justify beliefs and so on, end quote. So, can you explain like what error theory is and why it entails those very unusual things I just said that pain is not bad and visual experiences don't justify beliefs? Yeah. So um, error theory about normativity um, suggests that uh, normative claims, claims about ethics or about what it's rational to do or rational to believe or whatever, that those are all false. All the interesting ones are false. So it's error theory because it suggests that we've all been making a big error, right? Um, uh, and when it comes to normative harmony, so I've, I've focused on uh, hedonic states, on pain and pleasure, right? Uh, actually, what we talk about in the paper is this broader phenomenon of normative harmony, um, which includes not only pain and pleasure, but also things like um, uh, evidential support relations between beliefs and conscious states. So plausibly, when I have uh, the visual experience of the cup and you know, the tactile experience as of holding the cup and stuff. Plausibly, that justifies my belief that there is a cup there, uh, and it rationalizes certain behaviors, you know, not just opening my hand and letting the cup fall out and sort of stuff. Um, and sure enough, we find harmony there too. Um, so someone who is an error theorist, not just about morality or about the value of pleasure and pain or something like that, but about all of these things, uh, they say there there is no reason to pursue pleasure or avoid pain, really, uh, in fact, there is no evidential support relation between the contents of my consciousness and, uh, 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 you know, my behavior, or, that, or, or at least it's it's not evidential, it's not rational support. Um, that person will say all these examples of normative harmony are spurious, um, because in fact, uh, none of this stuff, all this stuff I said, is rationally appropriate. It's not really rationally appropriate, right? It's not rationally inappropriate. It's just that's just a mistake. Um, uh, first of all, that view seems wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like it could just stop there. Like, well, yeah, yeah. but that's wrong. <laughs> so I, I humbly suggest that view seems wrong. <laughs> um, but, uh, even if you hold that view, it doesn't actually solve the problem because you still have the cases of semantic harmony. You still have the fact that there's a semantic match when I say, there's a, a cup-shaped object in my visual field. And that's not a normative claim or a claim about what's rational or about what's valuable. That's just a, the my utterance has uh, has a certain content and it matches up with what's actually happening. Um, it, uh, so it, it wouldn't help with that. It wouldn't help if we go in for the, the cognitive harmony stuff, the fact that, um, you know, belief, desire, phenomenology matches up with my behavior. Um, you couldn't say that it rationalizes my behavior or something, um, but it still is the case that it it seems to the the Humean psychological model still seems to work reasonably well, right? That we can predict my behavior in terms of beliefs and desires, and you still have the fact that belief, desire, phenomenology accurately predicts what I'm going to do. Um, so uh, error theory, first of all, seems wrong. Second of all, doesn't even solve the problem. Right. Uh, it gets rid of some cases. It doesn't get rid of other cases.
Yeah, we didn't. I mean, the thing is, I would recommend that people just uh, read the paper. It is like it is a little long and it's a you know, it's a philosophy paper, so it's it can be dense. But like, you know, there's so much detail that we're not really able to cover in like this medium. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a. Yeah, par parts of the argument are, are very hard. Um, so it, it, it really will be helpful to people if, if they read through it, I think, because yeah. it, it, it's you, when you can spell everything out in detail and it's not just me talking extemporaneously and stuff, uh, it right. is a lot more careful. OK, so error theory, you know, I mean, like you say, it's it, the idea that like any idea that just entails things like, oh, pain is not bad. Um, the Black Plague was not bad. The Holocaust was not bad. Like, it's just like. Okay, well, I mean, that seems kind of like a reductio of any view, but I mean, some people go with it. But yeah, it doesn't answer semantic harmony, which we didn't get as much into. That's why I'm recommending people just like look at the paper. But um, there's another sort of more yeah, ordinary. The, the, the paper is posted online. Yeah, it's free. There's Google, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll link it in the show notes too. But there's another response that you that you mention, like a more ordinary naturalist response. Um, or you say the badness of pain depends on the attitude we take towards it. So how would that solve the problem? Yeah. So the thought there is people want to say sometimes, look, what's bad about pain is not the pain quale itself. What's bad is the fact that we don't like pain or that we desire not to be in pain or something like that. Um, and if the, if the other thing that makes the pain bad is something about how we're functionally disposed to respond to it. It's the fact that we avoid pain that makes it bad. Uh, then you have a solution to the hedonic harmony stuff. Um, so, uh, okay, we, we started out wondering, okay, we have reason to avoid pain, and this person agrees with that. And we do avoid pain, and this person agrees with that. Um, uh, how is it that that matches up? And uh, this person says it matches up because pain is bad precisely because we avoid it. Uh, so the order of explanation maybe is switched from what you would ordinarily think. But because we avoid pain, that is what makes it bad. Uh, it's the fact that we're disposed to, uh, to, to get away from it. First of all, that doesn't help with semantic harmony and so forth, blah, blah, blah. Um, but um, we also suggest if there's some plausibility to the thought that the pain quale itself is not what's bad and they're thinking about people who have you know they've had some weird surgery and now they say things like i'm in pain but i don't really mind it uh they no longer display the aversion to it um if it's true that the pain quale is not itself intrinsically bad but that it has to do with something else um we want to say nonetheless the total phenomenology that you're in at any given time um, has to be, uh, has to have some sort of intrinsic value. Um, and th this is, a, I think, a move that Guy Kahane defends, um, the, the thought that, okay, maybe it is the fact that we dislike pain that makes it bad, but the dislike has to be something phenomenological. It has to be some sort of felt dislike. Um, so if you imagine, um, uh, you know, the, someone who's being horribly tortured, uh, their phenomenology, any phenomenal duplicate of them will be in a bad state. Um, you could imagine, suppose that this person is a, a Cartesian soul uh, and they actually have no causal powers at all. They can't affect anything. So this person has no functional dispositions whatsoever, right? They're not averse to the behavior. They don't avoid the behavior, avoid the stimulus because they don't exhibit any behavior at all, right? They're just having mental states. Uh, nonetheless, I would not want to be that person, right? I, I wouldn't want to be a causally impotent, disembodied soul having the experience of being tortured uh, for a very long time. Uh, maybe this would be like a good theodicy of hell or something, as long as, <laughs> as, long as the people in hell <laughs> can't do anything. <laughs> they, they don't have any dispositions to behave in any way. Uh, it doesn't matter. If they're being no, of course not, right? Um, so the, the, the whole phenomenal, the, the complete phenomenological state, uh, if the pain itself is not what's bad, it still has to be something about the phenomenology, something about your conscious experience. Um, and that's enough to, to generate the harmony problem because, well, this whole phenomenological state, whatever the felt dislike is that makes the pain bad, couldn't that have not been there? Or whatever the felt like is that makes the pleasure good, couldn't that have been switched around or whatever, right? So that, that's right. what I say about that. 
All right. And that is like subtly different from saying that pain is intrinsically bad, right? Like saying that we're disposed to not like pain or pain is what we avoid. Like that's different from saying pain is just bad in and of itself. Yeah. So someone who's, I mean, thinking of pain as a conscious state, right? Specifically, the, the, you know, the thing you feel, that's pain. Um, initially, we framed the argument as, as if that's intrinsically bad. That's a bad thing, right? Um, the objector is thinking, no, pain is bad, but it's not, in, it's not bad just in virtue of the feel. It's not intrinsically bad in that way. It's bad somehow because of how we respond to it. It's bad because we don't like it. Uh, and we say, if that's true, the not liking still has to be something phenomenological. It has to be something conscious. It can't just be that we, in fact, are disposed to avoid it. or so. It can't just be behavioral. It has to be something about your experience. Um, and uh, if that's right, then that's enough to make the, the problem go through. So um, this isn't an objection to the argument specifically, but it's a question about the Bayesian approach more generally. So, um, you know, so let's say we just grant that like this psychophysical harmony, you know, does strongly favor theism over the kind of, you know, the more like standard forms of naturalism, um, you know, not including the more liberal forms where things, um, you know, it's more of an open question. But um, so, okay, we'll just grant that, like, psychophysical harmony is evidence that strongly favors theism over, uh, you know, standard naturalism. Um, but, like, how much does that actually matter at the end of the day? Like, so the the analogy that I um, have been using recently is, like, okay, imagine that you buy a new deck of cards, you take off the plastic, and you pull out one card, and it's king of hearts. So the odds of that, if it's a normal deck, are one out of 52. But if it's a um, on the hypothesis that it's a deck just full of king of hearts, then it's just entailed by that hypothesis. The odds are one. So, like, the hypo hypothesis two here, you know, is that um, it's just a deck full of uh, king of hearts, and, like, the data is entailed. It's much, much more expected on hypothesis two than hypothesis one. So it's strong evidence favoring hypothesis two over hypothesis one. And yet hypothesis one, that this is just a normal deck of cards is much, much more likely than, you know, the second hypothesis. So it must come down to prior probabilities, which gives the first hypothesis a significant advantage. Um, so that's easy in the case of like decks of cards, but like, how do we judge the prior probability when it comes to naturalism versus theism? And doesn't that kind of decide like, you know, the outcome of this issue anyway? Yeah. So, um, this is, uh, this is actually, I, I should have even mentioned this earlier in the interview because it's a good little rhetorical point on my end. Uh, philosophers of mind who discuss psychophysical harmony and who wonder how did this come about, particularly if they're sympathetic to, um, you know, uh, epiphenomenalist dualism or one of these views on which it's really pressing why, why it is that there's harmony. Um, they, they always wind up saying things like, of course, if you believed in a benevolent God, then that would solve the problem immediately. But, and then they say, but like, there's all this evil in the world. Or, but like, why believe in that? Why not believe in a cheese-loving God? Uh, who, then that's why there's so much cheese in the world. You know, uh, they, they say things that are attacks on the prior probability of theism. So they say, yeah, this would solve the problem, but like, come on, you know, it's independently impossible. Um, so, uh, it's it's true. It will depend on the prior probability. Um, if you think, I mean, we we claim that this evidence is very very strong. It's very very strong evidence. I think it's stronger actually than than the deck of cards evidence. Um, uh, and so, uh, if your prior probability in theism is not vanishingly low. Uh, we think that this should lead you to be a theist, at least, I mean, restricting ourselves to theism and standard naturalism for the moment. Um, uh, uh, we think that this should lead you to be a theist. Um, if it's vanishingly low, if it's low enough, then of course it's, it's trivial that the evidence, you know, for any given piece of evidence, if your prior is low enough, uh, in, in the thing that the evidence supports, then the evidence won't be strong enough to overcome the prior, right? 
Um, so then we get into the question of, uh, it, 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 even if you think theism is unlikely, it's perfectly fine for purposes of our argument if you think theism is unlikely or even very unlikely. Um, but uh, is it like vanishingly unlikely going in? Um, and to that, we, we think no. Uh, we think you shouldn't start out thinking that it's vanishingly unlikely. Um, and, you know, we give some reasons for that. We think that the intrinsic probability of theism is not wildly low. We think that, um, you know, even if you think that there are good philosophical arguments against theism, I mean, you know, there's got to be some chance that some theodicy works or something like that, right? Uh, there are other arguments for theism that are not like obvious failures. Uh, there are smart people who accept theism, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we think you shouldn't have a vanishingly small prior, and that might be then enough for all this evidence that psychophysical harmony provides to, to tip the balance. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess if you have a vanishingly small prior, maybe the evidence should make you bump it up to, okay, now I still think theism's unlikely, but not not as much as I used to or something like that. And, you know, I mean, that that's something. Yeah, um, yeah. So. yeah, I mean, this is about how, like, evidence shifts are, like, you know, posterior probabilities. So it's like, you know, I mean, that is ultimately, like, the goal of this argument, I think, is to just make theism more likely. Um but uh, you gave some example numbers here um, where you said, suppose that fif that harmony is 50 times more likely on theism than on atheism. You say you think that's very conservative. And um, before that, you think that theism is one-tenth as probable as atheism, so atheism is 10 times as likely as theism. Then when you actually like plug that into Bayes' theorem, then you get that uh, theism is five times as likely as atheism. So I, I think that people have to you know, consider those numbers, you know, or, or like just plug in different numbers of like, how unlikely do you think this is? Like, okay, like you can, you can just say like, all right, let's just grant that this is like some evidence favoring theism for the sake of argument. Okay, well, like, you know, how much do you think roughly? And like, what is your, like, what prior do you assign exactly? And then you can kind of plug that in and see the outcome. And, uh, yeah, I mean, so this, this should factor into some cumulative case for theism. And like, if I were making a devil's advocate case for theism, I would definitely mention this in like, um, you know, the top like three, probably, you know, a lot of atheists say like, they think that the fine tuning argument is the most interesting argument for theism, like the one they sort of take the most seriously. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, like there's no multiverse objection to this argument. So if you're, if you're already disposed to think that the fine tuning argument is like the best argument for theism or something, well, you know, congratulations, you have a new favorite argument for theism because this is just basically just like that argument, but it, um, it's on like more solid ground. Like the objections like don't all work, you know, the same way. And I don't know, just personally, it seems like um, some of the skepticism you can have towards fine-tuning arguments, it's not totally obvious how there's an analogy with, uh, with psychophysical harmony. Like, I've j like I've, I'm not one of those atheists who says that the fine-tuning argument is, like, the best argument. Um, I don't know if it's, like, irrational on my part, but as soon as physicists start saying, like, well, you know, we've figured out, like, a priori that, like, this is a life-permitting set of equations, and this one isn't, and I'm just like, I, I don't really believe you, personally. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so prior probability. Um, so what goes into that, you know, it, as uh, you mentioned, is, like, um, the intrinsic probability, you know, before we take into account any evidence, and then the background knowledge. And the thing about background knowledge is it's, it's like, just whatever you want it to be. <laughs> so you, you really could just kind of, like, you could dramatically lower the probability of, of theism, like, going in so that you could still be an atheist and say, like, yeah, I think it's, like, overwhelmingly likely that atheism is true because I have a low prior, because in my background knowledge, I'm incorporating every good argument that's ever been made for atheism. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you have intrinsic probability, and that's when people talk about theoretical virtues and this sort of stuff, that's where that's coming in, right? These are mm -hmm. the, the probability of the theory just taking it, uh, considering it on its own and its own intrinsic features before we consider how well it fits with other things. Um, background knowledge, um, I mean, presumably uh, what you want to do is, is build in all of the relevant background knowledge that you have. Um, and so, uh, 
Yeah, background knowledge will include arguments um, for atheism, arguments for this standard naturalistic picture of reality, whatever. Um, and it will also include any other arguments for theism that we have. Um, and uh, if you think, yeah, if you think the arguments for atheism are just overwhelmingly powerful, uh, overwhelmingly more powerful than the other arguments for uh, theism, um, and overwhelmingly more powerful than this argument, uh, then yeah, of course it's it's trivial that you'll you'll still be an atheist at the end. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I just I I would submit, and I think Brian would agree that um, we don't think even if you think that the arguments the other arguments for atheism are more powerful, we don't think you should think that they're like overwhelmingly overwhelmingly more powerful. Um, Brian Cutter, your co-author. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should probably mention him over an hour into the <laughs> conversation. Oh, yeah, I, think, I think I mentioned him at the beginning. You, uh, you can mention him uh, when you do the introduction. So I, I did have one question about this. Like, if we're just talking about conceivability, then wouldn't this also apply to God's mind in some sense? Like, some of these, um, like, not all of these instances of psychophysical harmony would apply to God if he's, um, well, I don't know what model of God you have exactly, but um, presumably some of them wouldn't apply to God regardless, but it seems like some of them would. So, I mean, if we're just talking about conceivability, I mean, God's mind could have conceivably been disharmonious, right? Like, it's possible to imagine it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think this this then will get into questions about the intrinsic probability of theism. Um, I mean, God, in, I mean, there isn't exactly the same harmony problem because, of course, God, I guess, doesn't have, you know, associated physical states or whatever. Um, but uh, there's still, yeah, the question if God has conscious states, then, um, you know, why, presumably they're orderly and presumably God's, you know, choosing to make the world phenomenology is, is accompanied by the world being created and this sort of stuff. Uh, so you have these other these other harmony problems. Um I mean, of course, there are people who have models of God on which God doesn't have conscious states, I guess. Uh, you know, Thomas and these sorts of people. Um, but uh, assuming that doesn't work, um, yeah, I mean, what you, would, what you want as a theist, I think, is to show that there's some kind of natural, simple way of characterizing God that entails God's other properties. Maybe it follows from perfection or from supreme value or Swinburne thinks from uh, what limit, pure limitless intentional power or something. There's some sort of root thing that captures, you know, the, the fundamental essence of God and that entails these other things. Um, and so I think what you want to do is, is find that and show that that's not wildly intrinsically improbable and then show that that entails that God's mental states will be harmonious. Um, yeah. And that's, that's how you get around the, the kind of revenge problem. Um, oh, is that what you call it? The... That's what I just called it right now. Yeah, I think someone else may have called it that in conversation with me once. Maybe that's where that came from. Okay. So I'm not the first person ever to ask, wait, God is also a conscious mind. Like, wouldn't this apply yeah. to him? I mean, uh, other people have raised that. Yeah. Well, it seems like, you know, because uh, when you say psychophysical harmony, it's not just that, you know, uh, phenomenal states and physical states are correlated in fortunate ways. It's also that phenomenal states are correlated with each other in fortunate ways. So, it, you know, it seems like it would apply to any conscious being. Um you know, some problem of harmony. And then the same problem would just rear its head, like, oh, I guess God is just lucky that his mind is this way instead of some other, because it could have conceivably been some other way. Um, so it just seems like, oh, go ahead. And, and, of, and of course, if you're a theist, you, yeah, you don't want to say it's just lucky that God's mind is that way. Just like you don't want to say, it's just lucky that God knows everything. You know, he could have just as easily not known about, uh, you know, pineapples, but like, fortunately he does. You don't want to say, ah, oh, it's just lucky that God is all good, or it's just lucky that God is all powerful or something, right? There has to be some unifying thing that explains why God is the way that God is. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there there are some people, I mean, I guess there are people who give ontological arguments or whatever. Maybe that would be the most satisfying way of, of going about that if it worked. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I, I think I think the way to do it is um, assuming that that doesn't work. Uh, I think the way to do it is is to try to show that there's some not so intrinsically improbable way of characterizing whatever God's fruit attribute is that would entail uh, the other the other fortunate features that God has. Okay. Um, so would that bear on the question of like God's reasons to bring about the values? realized by psychophysical harmony so it's like you know the the whole advantage is that you know god is the sort of thing that could explain why valuable states of affairs exist whereas like indifferent nature you know just can't do that uh, or at least it's it's not as it, it's just as unlikely as anything else um but you know okay so presumably god has some kind of reasons for bringing about um the values that are realized by psychophysical harmony so it's like well, I mean, what reasons are those? Like, why does he have those reasons or those desires or what have you? And it just seems like at some point the things just are that way. Like there's going to be some kind of explanatorily basic stopping point. And it seems like, you know, a naturalist could make that move too. Like, yeah, I there is an explanatorily basic stopping point. You don't get out of that problem just by positing a god. Um so if we're going to, you know, take like the Graham Oppie approach, it's like, well, you know, I can buy into my like spooky naturalism and I have some explanatorily basic like um, value involving laws or something like that. And it seems like there's going to have to be something analogous on the theistic side, but my model doesn't include a God. So it's like simpler and we should favor it um, on the basis of that consideration. Yeah. So, OK, so there are kind of two things, maybe. Um why why does god have the reasons that god has i mean i i guess i think that is given just by you know the nature of i mean i'm a, a value realist and i think that those are are necessary truths um uh so that it's valuable and that god has reason to bring about this thing of value is is just well couldn't couldn't a naturalist make use of that like because i agree with you i'm also a value realist so yeah sure 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 uh so a naturalist could agree if God existed, God would have uh, these reasons, right? Uh, and the naturalist can agree, I, I think, yeah, that these things are valuable and blah, 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 right? Um, uh, so that's not, I don't think that's the, I mean, that at least is common ground between the two of us. So I don't think that's the thing that needs to be explained. Um, uh, why is God motivated to bring about the valuable thing? Um well, again, this is going to get into questions about is there some reasonably simple route uh, that we can get that entails God's other properties. Um, uh, you might think, for instance, uh, I mean, the, the route that Swinburne goes is uh, thinking, well, omnipotence is um, kind of the simplest and most natural level of power to ascribe to God. And then that's going to entail omniscience. Uh, omniscience is going to entail that God knows what his reasons are. Um, and to explain why God would do something other than what his reasons are, you need to posit some other irrational desire. And that complicates the, the theory and makes it less intrinsically probable. Um, and so um, that, that's how it is that God winds up motivated uh, to promote value. It's just God knows what his reasons are and doesn't have countervailing reasons and so he doesn't, or doesn't so have countervailing motivations. And you're working with like some kind of like ethical non-naturalism there. Uh, I don't think it matters. I mean, it's ethical realism, but I don't think it matters either way whether it's non-naturalism well, or naturalism. So it would work with moral naturalism or non-naturalism. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I I take it moral naturalism. I mean, moral naturalism is a little bit of a. There might be a terminological question here because moral moral naturalism is people mean it. What they mean is something like normative properties just are descriptive properties, right? So these these things that seem non-normative turn out to be uh, identical to normative properties. Um, so um, theories on which like God is the good or something might count as moral naturalism on that sort of view, even right? Even though God is supernatural, it's you're identifying this descriptive characterization but yeah okay um i mean if if moral naturalism is the view that descriptive properties uh, or sorry that normative properties are identical to descriptive properties to some descriptive property or other and moral non-naturalism is the view that they're not they're sort of sui generis properties um 
I don't think that what I've said relies on either of those things. It does require, it, it, it does rely on the claim that there are objective facts about what's valuable that an, omni, an omni, omniscient being would know. And that uh, something's being valuable as a reason to bring it about or something like that. Um, uh, yeah. When, when it comes then to the, um, to the question, is it simpler to just have... To just stop things at the, uh, at the psychophysical laws, just stop things there, you know? Yeah, to just have the value involving laws or whatever, or just have the, the fortuitously... I mean, I guess there are different ways to go. Um, one, one way to go would be... Um, just posit the, that the psychophysical laws are what they are and not say anything more. Um, and that we think is not good because um, uh, you can't, I mean, I've tried to give a little, a little explanation of why God might not be so intrinsically improbable. Whereas we say it is very intrinsically improbable that uh, the psychophysical laws just happen to be uh, harmonious because only a tiny portion of the probability space involves harmonious laws and actually the ones that maybe seem most intrinsically probable because they're simplest or whatever are disharmonious. So the person in my position, like I have some kind of burden to explain, okay, so you want to go with Thomas Nagel or something, or at least I'm like, I'm like interested in it of like Thomas Nagel's natural teleology. Like you want to posit these teleological um, laws and you can do that. But you, if you want to deal with this argument, you're going to want some kind of reason why you have those laws instead of some other yeah, laws. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe you could provide, maybe say some sort of axiarchist could say, well, there's like a meta law that entails that the laws will be, you know, the best laws or will be good laws or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, then, then you'd have to talk about, um, I mean, again, you have to be a little careful because if you go to axiarchist, I mean, if it's just things exist because they're good, well, what's the most good thing? God, so he should exist, right? Oh, okay. That's what you meant for that. Yeah, you said axiarchism might entail theism, and I was like, oh, why is that? Yeah, so if you go to axiarchist, it might entail theism um, anyway, and then that would be fine with us. Um, but it has to be some 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 sort of like wimpy axiarchism, maybe. Um, can't, can't doesn't entail that God exists, but just um, affects... affects uh, the psychophysical laws. Yeah, I mean that's that's a um, that's a view. That's an interesting view. I guess I'm not totally convinced that it winds up being simpler than theism. I mean, maybe in some sense you. I mean, you wind up with fewer concrete substances or something. Um, but you know, if you start out with a, a single simple immaterial mind that's totally unlimited versus you know, what a sort of um, law selection principle or something like that, that also, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it runs, I mean, does that also lead to the creation of the physical world or is the physical world just being taken for granted as like an additional posit or, um, you know, there are different ways to spell it out, but it, I mean, it, it, at least I'll say it's not obvious to me that this winds up being simpler than theism. Okay. Um there is, I would, for anyone who's uh, interested in, in this route, though, um, Philip Goff has been thinking along these lines for a while. Like, he wrote an article for Eon about axiarchism and cosmopsychism. Like, he likes axiarchism, but he thinks that in the absence of, you know, theism or um, something like cosmopsychism, um, which some people say is kind of like pantheism. Um, but he's like, uh, it's just like axiarchism is just kind of unintelligible. Like it just doesn't really make any sense. Like, um, how to fit how, it how into this principle, bring it about that yeah. concrete substances exist. Yeah. It's like this abstract thing that's somehow making stuff happen. Like, it's just kind of, it's just very spooky and weird. And it like to the bordering on like, how does I, I literally can't conceive of how this is supposed to work. Um, so he writes about how he thinks that that's true, but then cosmopsychism sort of makes axiarchism intelligible. That's a lot of isms there for people who might not be familiar, but it's like, um, you know, you mentioned earlier how like panpsychism doesn't really uh, get around this problem, which is totally true. You know, just the idea that 
there are, you know, just in the same way that the physical activity of my brain, there's this subjectivity that's underlying it. Oh, it turns out all physical activity is like that, all physical activity. There's a corresponding subjective experience with all of it, not just some of it. That by itself doesn't, you know, explain this data. But the thing is, like, it's in a better position than some of these other hypotheses because it sort of naturally leads to things like axiarchism. Like, Goff was just saying that, um, Cosmopsychism makes axiarchism intelligible, you know? So, like, if you're already disposed to accept something like panpsychism, then, hey, good news, you know? But what I would say is, like, it's really hard to flesh out panpsychism, you know, beyond just the initial statement of what it is, but actually trying to flesh out, like, what does this mean in the real universe? Like, what is nature like? It's really hard to do that without ending up in some kind of, I don't know, axiarchist feeling place or something weird. Like, um, something that's like unusual that might be of relevance to this conversation. So the best example of that, I think, is when uh, Goff recently talked to Josh Rasmussen. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but they went on um, Christian Idealism's channel. It's, re it's really interesting because they're kind of on, you know, they're sort of like approaching each other, like in their views, like Josh is becoming way more idealist and Goff is trying to like his panpsychism like is seeming more and more idealist as time goes on and like they're and like Goff is kind of sympathetic to theism in a lot of ways um and Josh is open to like really weird forms of theism but it was just weird because they were finding this like this convergence and they were just uh just their areas of agreement were so unusual it just led to a really interesting conversation but the reason i bring it up is because it's like Goff was sort of trying to flesh out, you know, what does a panpsychist universe actually look like? Like, what does this actually mean? And that, where that led, I'm saying, is relevant to psychophysical harmony. So I think that, like, panpsychism puts someone in a better position, um, even though not initially. Initially, you're just as badly off as interactionist dualists and physicalists and so on. But I think because it can make something like axiarchism intelligible and might even just lead to something like axiarchism, um, that's why we're better off. That's that's interesting. I, I think I better just withhold comment until I've um I should probably go read read Goff's thing and, and think about it. Think about cosmopsychism some more. Yeah, no, I'll link that article for people who are interested and I'll also link that conversation on uh Christian Idealism's channel. Um yeah, because it was it was really fascinating for me at least. Um so uh, let me see here. Um, there, the one other thing I wanted to talk about, sort of the last objection that I had in mind, um, and then I just have one more question after that. But the last objection I had in mind is like, um, so valuable states or valuable states of affairs like weigh in favor of theism. I would say I don't know if this is kind of an oversimplified view, but at least for me, when I'm kind of thinking about theism versus atheism, like something that's sort of a template, I guess, for arguments for theism that I find at least better than many others is just the appeal to valuable things, I guess, because like theism, you know, does a lot better job predicting valuable things than indifference, you know, like a literally indifferent universe is like not very good at predicting valuable things and without lots of other stuff. Whereas theism, you know, it's kind of obvious, but the problem for that is disvaluable things. So, you know, there are like disvaluable states of affairs that weigh against something like a perfect being. So, you know, sometimes I feel like quite agnostic, like where I'm like, yeah, this could be true. You know, I don't know. It's, um, uh, but then the times when I feel like most convinced, like dead set that atheism is true is when I'm thinking about like the natural world and like animal suffering and evolutionary history and that sort of thing. And it's like, Hey, did a perfect being design this? It's like, no, obviously not. <laughs> like, what? But like, um, but yeah, like, so it's those sorts of disvaluable states of affairs, I think, that are, that must weigh against it, you know, if we're saying that valuable states of affairs weigh in favor of it, like, even just in the realm, I'm not just talking about the problem of evil, but like, well, I guess I am, but like, just in the realm of psychophysical harmony, there is psychophysical disharmony as well. Like, it's not like we're living in, a, in an enchanted uh, world of perfect harmony. Like, you know, there's schizophrenia and depression and mental illness and suicidal ideation and tendency to violence. Um, you know, th yeah, there are mental illnesses, you know, things that are, are disharmonious. You know, some people are attracted to children and it's like, it's clearly within God's power, you know, 
as a designer of the psychophysical laws to make pedophiles less attracted to children or like fewer people suicidal or schizophrenic, um, you know, in general, just like less disharmony. So things are not as disharmonious as they conceivably could have been. You know, it could have been a lot worse, but wouldn't indifference or at least one of those um, theism adjacent hypotheses you mentioned, like, wouldn't they do a better job explaining the mix of harmony and disharmony we see rather than like literally a perfect being? So is the question about indifference or is it about the the, the... well, I mean, the indifference and the theism adjacent hypotheses, like they both do a better job of predicting the mix of harmony and disharmony that we actually observe as, as compared to theism. So either one. Yeah. So I guess, um, I mean, when it comes to indifference, yeah. So, I, I mean, some of the things you listed maybe are just bad things. And then some of them maybe specifically are examples of disharmony in the sense that the sort of nice matching that we're talking about doesn't, doesn't obtain. Um, and yeah, the, those, the, the disharmony cases, um, arise when something has gone wrong. Right. So, uh, uh, Sometimes, I mean, people can like fail to act on their reasons. There's acratic action. There's free acratic action, right? And that can be explained maybe in terms of free will. But then schizophrenia, the sort of stuff can't be okay. Um, yeah, you do have this problem about so when things are kind of properly functioning, you have harmony. Then you have these other cases where something goes wrong and there's not harmony. Um, what about the fact that things go wrong and God doesn't stop it? Um, yeah, I guess I think indifference is so bad at, um, is so bad at explaining why, um, why things are harmonious, uh, when things go according to plan that, um, yeah, even if it, even if it helps with, uh, this case, even if it helps in these cases, uh, it doesn't do better overall. Now, when it comes to theism adjacent hypotheses, I mean, maybe maybe this is um, maybe this is a way to think about it. Uh, so the sort of the great mystery of the world is this mixture of teleology and disteleology, right? There are things that seem purposive and teleological, like they're leading somewhere, like they they had to have been produced because of the values they bring about. Then there are things that seem like they couldn't have been like that. There are things that seem totally senseless. They couldn't fit in any plan, blah, blah, blah. And um, kind of the two most popular responses for figuring out what the deal is are um, somehow reduce or explain the disteleology in terms of the teleology, say the bad things serve some good purpose, or maybe they don't serve a good purpose, but they're part of some framework that serves a good purpose and has as regrettable side effects that these bad things happen or whatever. Um, and then the other is to do the opposite, explain uh, the tele teleology in terms of the disteleology. Well, at bottom, things are purposeless, but you know, and if there are enough universes where just random crap happens, sooner or later, something neat will arise and uh, that gives the illusion of design and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so uh, what the theists want to do is the first thing, and what uh, the standard naturalists want to do is the second thing. Maybe what the theism adjacent person thinks they can do is a third thing, which is say, well, there is this teleological ordering principle, but it's not totally effective or something like that. It's not an omnipotent being or something. It's just yet another law of nature. It's yeah, it's a it's a principle that introduces a tendency or it's Plato's demiurge, you know, working against recalcitrant matter or something like that. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess I would say maybe two things. Um, one one thing is maybe as the example of the demiurge suggests um, uh, a theist could do that too, right? A theist could could limit God's power in some way. This is what process theologians do and these sorts of folks. Um, and then you could get the same, okay, there's the tendency towards order, towards value, but it's not totally effective, and that's why things go wrong. Um, and then maybe we would wind up with, you know, a similar set of questions about do we have reason to favor the limited God over the 
teleological organizing principle, law of nature type thing. Um, it might be that there are some, you know, uh, uh, if it turns out that, say, there are any good arguments uh, uh, from, uh, well, anyway, we don't even need to talk about that. Uh, it's just one thing is you might then need to make that decision on other grounds. Um, another, another thing to say is, in general, why do people favor the reduced one to the other explanations as opposed to the, well, there's just, you know, logos, but not, not too much logos. Um, I guess one thing maybe to worry about is just, it might feel like you have to get whatever the organizing principle is. Uh, it might have to have like a really kind of ad hoc, arbitrary amount of power in order to get the results that we want here. I mean, it, it has to bring it about that there is usually psychophysical harmony, but it can't get rid of pain or it can't, you know, um, it, it has to uh, maybe bring it about that there are laws of nature. If, you know, if you think one piece of evidence for design is the fact that there is fine tuning or the fact that there are elegant, comprehensible, uh, uh, mathematically describable laws of nature that govern everything. You know, it has to bring that about, but it couldn't have brought about some better set or it can't, you know, bring it about that when these are going to have bad consequences, that doesn't happen. Or um, I, I think one piece of evidence for theism has to do with moral knowledge and with other sorts of a priori knowledge, maybe. Uh, so, if for it to do that, then it has to be able to bring it about that we have those things, but it can't bring it about that, you know, there isn't uh, these sorts of bad things that we see. Um, so I guess one, one challenge for the person defending that sort of view is to explain like exactly what is the, what, what can the, the ordering principle do and not do and how does it work such that it can explain the things that we want to explain and yet it also is off the hook for the things that seem problematic for the theist, you know, right. um, and maybe, maybe there's some way to do that. Maybe there's, and, and, and the amount of power that it has doesn't seem, you know, just random. It's not just a list of here are all the good things that can do those. And, you know, here are all the bad things that can't stop those. Uh, but right. it's something that's reasonably natural and, um, and maybe that can be done. Um, but I guess that's sort of, that sort of worry is one reason why I don't go in that direction, I think, um, because you, yeah, you, you want to have enough explanatory power to get the good things, um, but too weak to get rid of the bad things. And it's a little not obvious how that works out. Right. I mean, so you don't think that it would work just to say like, well, look, this is one natural law among a host of natural laws. And like, you know, it's, it's not like, ad I mean, I guess there are some people who think that, you know, anything that has, that isn't like literally infinity or zero as a value is like, is kind of ad hoc or something, or like needs some kind of explanation. Like, but I mean, my problem with that sort of reasoning is just that it doesn't, even if you can say it kind of makes sense rationally, it's like, but you want to explain like the world that we actually have. Like, so yeah, maybe it would be simpler to say that God is like maximally good or maximally powerful and all that, but like, you know, you can see the world we live in and like, it seems kind of obvious to me, at least that it wasn't designed by a perfect being. Um, it doesn't mean God doesn't exist, but it, I mean, like certain conceptions of God, it's like, you know, so I think process theists like might provide some kind of model here where it's like, well, it's not crazy to just say that, you know, God can't bring about literally any conceivable state of affairs. Like, so I, I mean, at least for me, like thinking of teleological laws or just some kind of value involving laws it's like yeah they're not like this overpowering overriding thing you know in the same way that like any other law of nature doesn't like override and overpower every other law of nature there's just like a host of natural laws that exist yeah i, I mean i guess i'd want to see the story i mean i see the motivation i'd want to see the story spelled out for why why this law has the good the good effects and not more good effects or doesn't get rid of bad effects um uh and I, I do think, yeah, I mean, it could be that you wind up with sort of a contest between, you know, intrinsic probability and fit with evidence or something like that. And then you have to make judgment calls. Um, even even process theologians, I guess, you know, they, they do feel the need to try to come up with some sort of explanation of why God can do and not do things. You know, it's not just like, well, God can cast eight spells a day. 
Uh, and, and, you know, once, once he's done enough miracles, then, you know, he, he's just out of juice until he recovers. You know, they, they want to give some, we need to rethink divine power in some really fundamental way so that God is persuasive and not coercive. And all he can do is gently nudge things, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think that's probably maybe the way to go is to try to find if, if we go the, you know, this, the, the, this third option. Uh, I think that's the way to go is to try to find some kind of reasonably natural way of explaining how the limited God or the ordering principle or whatever it is can can only, you know, make things tend, but but doesn't quite get all the way there. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a little tricky because in, in the case when you say it's contending with other natural laws, um, I mean, I guess I'm thinking of, of the psychophysical laws as being among the natural laws. Uh, so it's not quite contending with the natural laws. It's selecting the natural laws, or at least it's selecting some of them, um, because it's bringing it about that some psychophysical laws are in place rather than others. Um, Wait, say that again. You're saying that I thought that we were talking about when, when you say psychophysical laws, I assumed that you were saying that, like, God designed laws of nature that you're calling psychophysical laws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. When, when it comes to your proposal about the, the sort of there's a natural law that biases things towards value. Um, for it to its end, you said maybe the reason that it biases things towards value, but not too much, doesn't get rid of the evil. Um, is that it's one natural law contending with other natural laws, and so there are a lot of forces at play, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what I was saying was, if it's responsible for psychophysical harmony, it looks like this value involving natural law must have selected some of the other natural laws. It must have selected the natural laws. Um, uh, so this would be like a meta law or something like you mentioned with axiarchism. Okay. Yeah. And then, then I wonder, okay, why is it that it was able to select some of the natural laws, but if we're worried, you know, couldn't there be other better natural laws that didn't lead to so much evil? Why couldn't it select the, the other, why couldn't it make the other laws different or why couldn't it, when it was selecting the psychophysical laws, why couldn't it just leave out the ones that allow for pain? You know, you could have just become a zombie for a second while you went through pain or, um, you know, I mean, or couldn't, or maybe it could have just bumped everything up, right? Uh, uh, on on the the hedonic scale, just bump everything up a little bit. Um, uh, uh, you know, so no, I, I, I see mean, the motivation. I, I, totally... I see the motivation for the view. It just, it, I, I, without it being spelled out how it's supposed to work, um, I just it, a lot of questions arise about how it winds up having enough power to get what we want to explain while lacking enough power to not have problems explaining why these other things happen. That's, that's all I'm saying. So that's sort of the, yeah. And I would imagine that you would grant that like, obviously theists have this burden too, but you know, there are theodicies and like, you know, theists do try to explain why there's evil and why there's yeah. disharmony. Well, yeah. I mean, traditional theists, the problem is not, how did God have the power to do this one thing and not the power to do the other thing? The problem is explaining, okay, God has the power to stop the bad thing. Why doesn't he? Right. Yeah. Um, and of course that's a problem too, right? <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the problem of evil. Um, and that's what moves some people to go in the process route of saying, well, maybe God doesn't have the power and we need to explain what his power is really like and all that kind of stuff. Um, right. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I grant, I grant the problem of evil is a problem. It's a serious problem. There was one other question I wanted to ask, um, about just the, I mean, just the history of the argument, I guess. So it's the subtitle is, you know, a new argument for theism. Um, so like how new is the argument? Like, are there any like predecessors to it? Like appeals to harmony? Um, as evidence for theism. Like, I, I remember reading the phrase, like, pre-established harmony, I think, in, like, William James or Leibniz or something like that. Um, so, like, is there a precedent for this historically? Leibniz talks about the pre-established harmony. It, it's it's a little different for him. I mean, Leibniz believes that everything is monads. Uh, so all that exists are simple substances. Um, and there are infinitely many of them, and they never interact with each other. They have no windows and no doors. Uh, and so, and, and yeah, they never interact with each other and they never receive causal inputs. So then Leibniz has this problem of, 
okay, so like my monad and your monad, how is it that we're having a conversation, right? It seems like we're interacting, uh, but really we're not. There's no such thing as causation. Um, and that's where the pre-established harmony comes in. God, uh, it, pre, you know, preordaining, seeing how everything's going to play out. God built in my experiences as of you talking and your experiences as of me talking. Um, and this is why it seems like we're interacting because God pre-established uh, that every all of our experiences would be as if the other people were really there interacting with us, right? Uh, that's what the Leibniz pre-established harmony is. Um, huh? <laughs> do I? I just said, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's it's a fun, you know, it's it's a fun picture of the world. I mean, it's you know, there are infinitely many monads, and all of them have built it all of them you know like anything that any other one is doing somehow is built into me because i need to be able to anticipate it right when when the moment comes and similarly i am built into all of the others so there are infinitely many monads and we all reflect god's omnipotence and omniscience in that we all are affecting the others and they are i mean not really affecting but it's as if you know knowledge of what we're doing is built into all the others and knowledge of what they're doing is but anyway it's, it's a very beautiful picture um but uh yeah i mean i mean the pre-established harmony of Leibniz, first of all you might just think that's not the way the world is uh, we're not made of monads that don't interact um but also i don't think he treats as a it treats it as an argument for theism it's just that he has this issue that arises because of his metaphysical framework and then god explains what that issue is right but you know he, the art uh, explains how to solve that but you know his arguments for theism are, are different things um uh i think i mean there might be some sort of precedent for this argument that i don't know about as far as i know i invented the argument when i was an undergraduate <laughs> um, as, as far as I know, that's when the argument was first made. There are other people who talk about psychophysical harmony, right? And, you know, you mentioned William James. They don't always use the term psychophysical harmony. There are other people who've talked about psychophysical harmony over time. Um, but in terms of treating it as an argument for theism, as far as I know, me and in, in, as like a junior was the first one to, to think of that. And then Brian actually independently came up with the idea. So maybe it was an idea whose time had come, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we independently invented it. As far as I know, no one else has given it. Now, there are people who have given other arguments from consciousness for theism, of course. So, Right. And they're all bad except for two of them. This is, this is one of the good ones. <laughs> what's, what's the other good one? Uh, Jeff Lauder's F inductive argument from consciousness is just that like theism entails that consciousness exists, but naturalism doesn't. So consciousness is evidence for theism. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I think other people have given arguments for theism from consciousness. Um, this goes back at least to Locke. Um, Locke, you know, has a certain picture of the material and he thinks, well, how does the, how does the mental get in there? And he thinks that has to be God. Um, and, you know, Swinburne, Robert Adams, J.P. Moreland, um, a lot of people have given arguments from consciousness um, to theism, either appealing to the fact that consciousness exists to begin with, consciousness exists, and that's more likely on theism, or appealing to uh, something like, for instance, Swinburne thinks, look, the, the psychophysical laws have to be really complicated, they have to match up all these different sorts of experiences with, uh, you know, different macro level physical states and stuff. And it's very improbable that this whole big convoluted, complicated set of laws would exist without any deeper explanation. Uh, we need some simpler, deeper explanation. And he thinks that comes from, from theism. Um, so there have been arguments that appealed just to the existence of consciousness or to you know, the existence of psychophysical laws or the supposed complexity of psychophysical laws, that sort of stuff. As far as I know, we're the first ones to actually give an argument um, for uh, from psychophysical harmony to theism, except for the people who scoffingly say, yeah. <laughs> of course, God would solve this problem. Now, I came up with the argument before any of them said that. So I, I still <laughs> think it's original to me. 
<laughs> but in print, we're the we're not the first ones to say it. We're just the first ones to say it without a smirk. Right. Um, right. So. Yeah, because I first came across the idea from Hedda Hassel Merck, the Norwegian philosopher of mind, where she was making arguments against epiphenomenalism and made basically, you know, a similar argument to what we made at the beginning and, you know, appeals to William James's thing. But it's like, yeah, and then she does mention like, oh, yeah, theism, I think, would solve this, but, you know, we can't be theists. And I think, um, you know, Philip Goff does the same thing, but he appeals to the problem of evil. But, yeah, there are... Um, Adam yeah. Watts does the same thing. So the thing with the other arguments from consciousness, though, like the reason I think they're all bad is not because they're like they're all like every part of them is all bad. Like, you know, Swinburne makes arguments against physicalism, and I think that those arguments are decent. And then he tries to connect it to theism. And that's where it always goes off the rails for me, where it's like, OK, because arguments from consciousness typically go like physicalism is false, therefore theism. And then there's like a little bit of stuff in between that usually does not make it any clearer to be at least than what I just said. Um, but yeah, it's like I just don't see how you really get from not physicalism to theism. And like no one's ever really, you know, drawn it out for me in a way that makes sense. And plus Swinburne's argument is bad for other reasons as well. Like the, his, like the idea that like, Oh, oh the psychophysical laws or, or whatever, like they'd have to be so complicated because there would have to basically be a law of nature for every experience you have or something like that. Like, I never really understood why that was the case, like why there couldn't just be some underlying simple set of laws that explained the complexity of what we observe, like, you know, um, every other natural law <laughs> in existence, where it's like something that's relatively simple and then it explains a diverse array of phenomena. It's not like you have to have different laws of gravity for apples falling and planets orbiting and pens falling and pencils falling. But Swinburne seems to think that that would have to be the case with consciousness, where you'd have to have like... In a, an incredibly complex set of laws or something for everything that happens. Yeah, I, I think we even maybe offhandedly say, you know, these seem like specu very speculative claims about the ultimate form of the laws or something in, in the paper. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I may be, I mean, I, I may be, I'm probably more into the other arguments from consciousness for theism than you are, but... Um, yeah, it, it does all come down to when you say it. then there's a little bit of stuff in the middle. There, there's a big question about what the little bit of stuff in the middle is. And I do think that our argument is the best one. Um, I, I think that it avoids some of the some of the pitfalls that the other. Well, I mean, you don't start off arguing that physicalism is false, though. Like that's right. Yeah, yeah. Have. One one reason is that we don't need to, we don't need at the beginning the the claim that physicalism is false, um, and we we don't need speculative claims about the nature of the or about the the form of the final psychophysical laws how complicated they'll be um you know we we can do without a lot of the stuff that the other arguments require um so i mean you i'm know, not an unbiased judge right so of course i, I would think this right <laughs> but, but you know i think it's pretty good I think it's a pretty good argument i think it's pretty good too i mean like i you know we spoke like a year ago about dualism and then you just like mentioned this offhand i think i mentioned um head as like argument again yeah and then you were like oh yeah i'm about to publish something that's like this argument but i think it applies to everything not just epiphenomenalism and um yeah so i mean i was already sold like i was already on board with the whole with the first step i guess so then I, it was pretty easy for me to like go along with the rest of it and plus you know you were as you were saying like you know the target is kind of like ordinary atheism like you know reductive physicalism that sort of thing and i'm just like well i don't think that's true anyway so i didn't really have anything at stake and yeah it was um but yeah i mean i so i might be biased as well as what i'm is what i'm saying but i think that it is like you know i and you know i mentioned this earlier a lot of people think that the fine-tuning argument is the best one it's like well this is just a better version of the fine-tuning argument and like presumably the fine-tuning argument is also about this stuff right like there it's not just about um the existence of life or something because there could just be microbes like what you want is like you know complex life like us that you know instantiate or realizes all these values and um yeah it just seems like the thing about fine tuning is not that there's like complexity or um e or even life it's like that there are there's like valuable complexity and that there's like le you know a certain kind of life so i don't know this one seems like a better version of the fine-tuning argument, I mean, not just for the multiverse reason, but also because 
it doesn't rely on um claiming that you can just look at a set of equations and predict the entire history and evolution of that universe um which is a source of skepticism for me personally for other fine-tuning arguments but yeah this just seems like a much more like direct and like better version of a fine-tuning argument where it's like okay here's the thing we actually care about with fine-tuning it's not like complexity or life or something like this is the thing that we actually care about and it's you know impervious to like one of the most common objections to fine-tuning arguments um yeah so i mean i and yeah i just think it would be an important addition to like any cumulative case so, I mean, I guess we're on the same page about that, but other arguments from consciousness, you know, you can be a theist and a physicalist, first of all, like some people are, and you can be an atheist and a non-physicalist. So like the best you could do, it seems to me, is to make some kind of like very, very weak Bayesian case that like, well, if theism is true, we might expect non-physicalism to be true, like marginally more than, than whatever. But I think that like a lot of those arguments get their force from just being like, um, in the time and place that they're in atheism is like sociologically connotated with you know physicalism or whatever like even though i don't think there's really any logical connection between them like i'm not a physicalist like many atheists who i respect are not physicalists like noam chomsky and thomas nagel and david chalmers and galen strassen and so on it's like um yeah i just don't really see much of a connection between atheism and physicalism i don't really see much of a connection between theism and non-physicalism the absolute best that i can see is like maybe there's like a very marginal like shifting of probabilities like because you might expect non-physicalism to be marginally more likely on theism but beyond that i don't really and even that i'm not so sure about so is there uh anything else that you wanted to mention i'm trying to remember if there's a any crucial part of this argument. I mean, like I said, people should just read the paper. There's a lot of detail that is just impossible to cover in this medium. Um, but there's also just, you know, there's so many interesting things that just come up in the argument, like stuff about Bayesianism and conceivability. Um, simplicity is a theoretical virtue, um, just like general philosophy of mind stuff. Like there's all kinds of interesting stuff that just like comes up in passing. And it was like a very interesting read for me, like for that reason, like at one point, I read the part about, um, like Spinozism, like necessitarianism and like the arrangement of stars in the sky. And it actually like indirectly led to me becoming a compatibilist. (laughs) (laughs) So like reading the section in this paper about the necessitarianism and, um, you know, cleaving like metaphysical and epistemic possibility. And I feel like it leaves room for, um, you know, alternate possibilities, which some people think is important for free will. But anyway, all I'm saying is that in reading this paper, there were just like throwaway things that like uh, influenced other views I have, um, including stuff about Bayesianism and whatnot. So highly recommended for me. It's it is a it's a pretty complicated argument, and a lot of stuff comes up, and it's even even the things that we have talked about, you know, are handled more carefully in the paper and stuff. So yeah, I, I would encourage people to go to go read it. Um, and it's, I mean, it is kind of long, but I don't know. I think it's not, you know, it's kind of fun. It is fun. It's dense, so it's you know not for the the weak of heart, I guess. Um, but yeah, it is like forty pages long. But um, yeah, hopefully this made it more. Uh, digestible and hopefully um especially in the first like 10 minutes or so people get a gist of what the argument is and i would like to see more people you know debating it and like discussing it and stuff because like i said i think this is a really good argument for theism um and uh yeah go follow dustin on twitter um dustin crummett and go to dustincrummett.com to read his other stuff i also in the intro i was going to mention that uh, you went on Crusade Against Ignorance a bunch of times, uh, Mike Edvinson's channel. Um, so I'll link those in the description. But uh, yeah, is there anything else you wanted to mention, or you know, places where people can find you? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm on I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, Twitter. Um, I'm I'm I've been saying for a long time I'm going to start a YouTube channel, and I am at some point. Uh, uh, I don't know. I have, I have a, a book. I have an applied ethics book that I co-authored with some other folks that people can can look up uh, if they're interested in that. I have another book coming out with Kevin Vallier at some point in the future that we're writing right now. Um, What's that going to be about? Uh, that's uh, it's about um, politics, philosophy, and economics. Um, so it's it's uh, Rutledge is doing this series of books that are all like fifty puzzles, paradoxes, and thought experiments about 
epistemology, about metaphysics, whatever. So we're doing the, the politics, philosophy, and economics uh, version of that book. So it's it's a bunch of a discussion of a bunch of different little, you know, interesting concepts or thought experiments or uh, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, right. It seems like the bulk of your work is about like ethics and political philosophy. Is that right? Yeah, ethics and political philosophy and um, and various things and usually things in philosophy of religion that sort of overlap with those, like the problem of evil or whatever. Right. Um, so the the really well, I guess I have a, a paper that's coming out in Utilitas that is ethicsy, but also sort of film mind film mindy. Um, that that one and this one are are really the two main film mind type things that I've actually published, uh, even though it's kind of a uh, an interest of mine, you know, in other ways. Yeah, that applied ethics book is is really great too. It was recommended to me by um, Salem, who used to be inspiring Christianity, um, because he really liked the abortion um, chapters. Or chapter, but um, I've only read that chapter so far, the first uh, abortion one, and the general introduction. But that's, that's not what I wrote, so I can't take any credit, <laughs> any credit or blame uh, for anything in those. Um, yeah, it does seem it seems pretty even handed. I don't know if I'm just biased because I'm pro choice, but it did seem slightly like leaning in favor of the pro life side. I mean, I, I don't know if if that's accurate or not. If the authors are like pro life, but. Uh... I, there were multiple people who wound up involved who I think have different views. Um, it seemed it was very it was ve- it was the most even-handed thing I've ever read about abortion. I can say that, no, but really. it's still okay. the- <laughs> well, there, there you go. Yeah, I I wrote I mostly wrote the stuff. Well, I wrote uh, a chapter about humane farming, um, whether that's okay, uh, and I wrote a chapter about obligation to future generations. Uh, and I wrote a chapter about environmentalism, and uh, I wrote a chapter about obligations to wild animals. I was going to say, I, th- I was assuming that you contributed to the wild animal suffering one. I thought I heard you mention somewhere, because um, I'm trying to hold off on, on reading that one, because it, it never has a problem seemed so incredibly impossible to solve to the point where i'm just like i don't want to think about this like I don't, there's nothing i can do <laughs> but i'm sure that that will be addressed so anyway yeah people should buy that uh book you know applied ethics uh the, the chapter i've read is pretty good um yeah but anyway so i think that about covers it thank you so much for coming on yeah yeah uh, thanks thanks for having me absolutely anytime and um maybe we'll organize a debate between you and mike humor sometime <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha